they're trying, but we still, it's going to be in a step uh, ladder manner, but it's going to be a while until then, unfortunately, we have to be a bit protected. Shall we start, Mr. Singhania, at six o'clock? Yes, is, it, is it okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm all, uh, okay, let's, let's go. I'm all Sounds set. Sounds good. By the way, you have a lovely artwork behind you as well. It looks almost yeah. like Ramachandran there, but I don't know what it is. That is a Ramachandran. You're absolutely right. There you are. <laughs> lovely. Wonderful okay. person. With your permission, I'm going to start now. Uh, Mr. Gurcharan Das, Mr. Hashpati Singhania, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to everyone in IMA's very popular Leader Speak program, the 43rd in its series. Our guest speaker this evening is the renowned CEO turned management guru and storyteller, Mr. Gurta, Mr. Gurcharan Das. Mr. Das, it's always a pleasure to have you with us and this time after quite some time. Many thanks Thank for agreeing to do this session for us. You're a man of many talents, a management guru, a political theorist, an economic commentator, a novelist, and a dramatist. You're an exceptional person who studied both management and philosophy at Harvard. A former CEO of a giant global corporation, PNG, you've observed organizational and individual behavior across many cultures and culled deep insights about the pursuit of both wealth and wisdom. A classicist in taste, you draw on the ready authority and accessibility of ancient Indian epics to convey your management concepts to the modern managers. Your trilogy of books, India Unbound, The Difficulty of Being Good, and Kama, The Riddle of Desire, is an excellent discussion of the ideals of prosperity, purpose, and passion. You made a case for an authoritative government in India in your political book, India Grows at Night, a liberal case for a strong state. You also write regularly for the leading foreign and domestic newspapers, including the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Times of India. You have also prepared a multi-volume book on stories of Indian business from the ancient to the modern times. Both executives and management students could learn a lot by reading these stories. We are so delighted to have you on the IMA platform, and we look forward to hear you share your views and your stories and wisdom during this session. Your subject for this interaction is very provocative and intriguing. Everyone wants more from life than just work and income. But as John Lennon of the Beatles once said, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. The daily scramble to pay bills and build a nest egg consumes much of the energy and attention, and the bigger things like changing the world take a back seat. However, everyone feels the need to do something more than just make money to feel truly happy and fulfilled. It is an unending quest, and we would like to use this opportunity to tap into your great wisdom to learn how we can make a life and not just a living. With these words, it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Hashpati Singhania, President Aima, to conduct the session. Over to you, Mr. Singhania. Thank you, Rekha. Thank you so much. Uh, well, all Aima friends, uh, Guru Charanji, Rekha, and everybody on this call, uh, a very good evening to all of you. And we are delighted once again uh, to, <clears throat> to be here on this platform at the very popular Leader Speak session of IMA. And today, of course, we have a very distinguished guest with us. Um, let me first say that Mr. Guru Charan Das has been an old friend. Before I make his other introductions, Rekha has, has mentioned many, and I will add a couple of things, or repeat rather, I can't add anything. But he has been an old friend, and I am so delighted uh, to welcome you personally and on behalf of IMA. I still remember the long conversation we have had, or we, long conversations we have had several times. But I must mention in this platform one regarding a particular book, one your last book, wherein you and I spoke at length about a, a fictitious quote-unquote address in New Delhi. 
And we, we were discussing the pros and cons of what number it should be and whether it should be off, off the main road in the lane and so on. Always a delight to talk to you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, um, Guru Charanji is as much a social and political philosopher as he has been a corporate pundit. His formal education was at Harvard where he studied philosophy. And later on, he attended the AMP program over there where he is featured in several case studies. He quit his job at Procter & Gamble, uh, India to make a living from his thoughts and wisdom. So he had a long run uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, in the corporate world. And if I remember correctly, it was starting with before Procter & Gamble with Vix, as the company used to be then. Uh, and then when it got acquired by Procter & Gamble, it became Procter & Gamble India. And you've done a lot of path-breaking things over there. He has been outstanding successful as a commentator and also as a theorist, and it's our pleasure to host him in today's program. Among his many celebrated literary works, the trilogy based on the classical Indian goals of the ideal life stands out. Thank you for being here, and it's a great pleasure to have you, to agree, Dr. Charanji, to share your thoughts with us this evening. The topic of your talk, making a living versus making a life, is a universal theme and every individual struggles with that choice, especially if I may dare say, at the midlife stage. We look forward to hearing your perspective on this eternal dilemma, especially in the context of urban individuals like us. Not everyone experiences the choice between making a life and making a living in the same way. Many never know the difference and many gloss over the differences to maintain peace in their life. In fact, the vast majority of humanity see this question as one of affordability and not one of intellectual inclination or capacity. Overwhelmed by needs, most people cannot spare time or energy for the reflection and go through their lives accepting that making a living is the purpose of life. However, it does not have to be so. Education, values, and reflection, or self-reflection, if I may say, are the keys to opening the doors of consciousness and irrespective of personal and family circumstances, one can afford a layer of awareness that elevates living to life. Guru Charanji has argued in his essays, the problem is that nobody bothers to teach people the difference between making a living and making a life. The middle-class parents devote themselves to badgering children into getting good grades in schools, to getting into branded or known colleges to improve the prospects of finding a good job and, if I may add, a good matrimonial alliance. The institutions of higher learning also cater to this rat race by tailoring their curriculum to the needs of making a living. As a result, most of our MBAs, engineers, doctors, chartered accountants, all professionals go through a midlife crisis. They accumulate money by succeeding at their one dimensional careers and miss having a meaning or purpose in their lives. Work life balance has become a major issue, as we all know. Professionally successful, but personally empty. Many people turn to religion, nationalism, politics, or better things like charity and even golf. The key to having a life beyond making a living is perhaps to find meaning and purpose in one's work. Separating life's work from life's purpose only amplifies frustration and can make a person feel dissatisfied. When making a living ceases to be a chore and becomes integral to pleasure, work-life balance ceases to be an issue. In organizations where the people feel that they are doing something good and not just slogging for a salary, they take the initiative 
and go beyond the means of the terms of employment and help the organization achieve purpose. Guruchanji, you spent decades observing and analyzing personal and social mindsets. And we have an opportunity to gain from this observational knowledge of yours. It is now my pleasure to invite you to share your thoughts and remarks with us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh. Uh, that was a, a brilliant uh, introduction, actually, to the subject. You've made my job uh, easier because you actually prepared the ground. Uh, you, you prepared the ground very well. Just one second. I've got to tell my wife here to keep, keep low volume. Uh, she's making comments comments to some other people. You, okay. You, you, so, you <laughs> in public? <laughs> Re, Re, Rekha, Rekha called me a management guru and I must uh, disabuse you of all of, of that notion of a guru of that sort. Uh, I've always believed that such a guru was good at understanding G-U, but relatively useless, R-U. <laughs> but, you know, my name, of course, also contains the word guru. So this creates a problem. Uh, but it wasn't always so until the age of three, my name was, believe it or not, Ashok Kumar. But my grandmother suspected that my mother had given me that name because she thought my mother was secretly in love with a Bollywood actor named Ashok Kumar. So this wasn't an appropriate thing. And so she took me to her, to my father's guru and placed me at his feet. And when he saw me at his feet, she said, Guruji Enu Nadio, give this boy a name. And the guru, uh, saying, seeing where I was, said the most appropriate name would be Guru Charan Das. So overnight, at the age of three, I was transformed from Ashok Kumar, the prince of happiness, to Guru Charan Das, the humble servant of the feet of the Guru. Imagine that. And I guess the Guru was trying to give me a message about humility and other such virtues. Anyway, um, you very rightly introduced the theme that of, of the talk, making a living versus making a life. And as you've harsh explained very well that most of us are caught up in the rat race, grubbing for marks when we are in school and college and climbing ladders when we are at work. We are focused on the next promotion and we forget the difference between making a living and making a life. I learned from my mother with her middle-class insecurities the idea of making a living. And I learned from my father, who was a spiritual man, uh, the, the making a life. So I'm going to talk to you, give you two stories this evening. One is the story of a man, a real true story of a man who worked with me. Uh, and he probably taught me more than anybody else about making a life on your job, as you put it, Harsh. And the other is my story, which tried to make a living in a somewhat different way, uh, combining both the inside of work and outside of work. So since I've introduced the notion that of learning from my father and my mother, let me begin with my story. And I'll divide it and, and move to the other story, which I think is the more important story afterwards. So <clears throat> my earliest memory is from uh, Lahore when I was in kindergarten school. 
in kindergarten and I came home. Our school was in model town and I came home with a report card in my hand and my mother saw me with a smile and she asked, did you stand first? And of course, this was exactly the wrong question that she should have asked. She was thinking of making a living. Here's this boy uh, who is going to get good marks in school, do well and get a good job. And of course, she, was, she came, we were from a middle-class family in Punjab. The family budget was always tight. My father was an engineer with the government. And, and, and so uh, really, she was concerned about, uh, you know, that I should grow up to be self-sufficient in some ways. And I was lucky when I finished school to, I got the, I was unbelievably lucky to get a scholarship at the age of 17 to go to Harvard. And of course, my mother counseled me that now go to wherever you're going, make sure you study something useful so you get a job. And so she said, well, look at your father. Be like him, get a job as an engineer. So when I arrived at Harvard, they told me, boy, you've come at the wrong school. Just down the river, River Charles, is another school called MIT. Now they will do a better job of making you an engineer than, than Harvard. Well, the problem of shifting to MIT was too great at that particular time. And very quickly, the dreams of becoming engineer were forgotten and I got caught in the romance of the liberal education. And I went against my mother's wishes and found myself in the next four years learning to make a life because that's what a undergraduate education is supposed to do, not teach you a trade. Harvard made it very clear that even if you wanted to learn a trade such as medicine or accounting or law, they were graduate schools meant for that, not an undergraduate. Anyway, I graduated in what my mother called a useless subject called philosophy. And then I had a scholarship to go on to do a PhD at Oxford in philosophy. And I was back home in Chandigarh where my parents, my father was now uh, chief engineer to the government of Punjab. And so I was relaxing, actually lying down on the grass outside in a park in, outside our house. And I asked myself, do I really want to go and spend the rest of my life at that stratosphere of abstract thought? No, I said. I wanted a life of action, I felt, because I'd had four years of thought. And, and so I didn't go to Oxford. And, and instead, I got a job selling Vicks Vaporub in the bazaars of India, selling Vicks Vaporub in the bazaar, dusty bazaars. So from the ivy covered halls at Harvard, I was carrying a salesman's bag, selling Vicks Vaporub. And, and, and so it was partly, my mother was of course quite pleased that I'd got a job. <laughs> that I was on my way to making a living. Uh, and that she was said, oh God, lucky that she wasn't going to have an unemployed son at home now, you know. Uh, 
And I also actually like the rough and tumble. I thought I'd try it out, you know, rough and tumble of the business life. And, but at the same time, I couldn't quite make a break with my year, years in college, uh, in, in, which were so exciting in the intellectual life of the university. So I did something halfway. So for five days, I, had a, I was a man of action. But on Saturday and Sunday, I was a man of thought because I read and then began to write. And so I began, I wore, uh, from my early 20s, I wore two hats. And both I took very seriously my work and I enjoyed it, uh, selling Vicks Vapor Rub. But also I enjoyed very much the relaxation of the weekend. And I then started writing my first play. And I was lucky, the play, uh, there was a competition and the play won a big prize and uh, it was produced by Alec Padamsi in Bombay and uh, Al-Kazi in Delhi. And then it was done on BBC. It was published by Oxford University Press. And then I was uh, transferred to the company's office in New York, the headquarters. And there I wrote a second play called Mira on Mirabai. And a small, off-Broadway theater called La Mama, but made a rock musical of Mira Bhajans, converting them, and it was a, quite a success. So at one point I thought, you know, shall I exchange my weekend job for my weekday job? But no, I met my wife at that time and, you know, responsibilities, plus I didn't mind my work. And so there I was, making a life in my own way. In similarly, in my 30s, I wrote a novel called A Fine Family. It was a partition novel. And uh, Sean Benegal uh, offered to make a film of it, which he, the wretched fellow never did. And, <clears throat> and so I you know, went down the corporate ladder. And, but so as you have, as Rekha and you have actually described it, by the late 40s, I had what you call Harsh, the midlife crisis, meaning I came to work one day and I was head of strategy for the worldwide company. And I was looking at market shares of our major brands, Pampers, Tide detergent, Crest toothpaste, uh, oil of Olay, and good brands, all of them. Uh, and then I looked out the window and I said, is this all there is to life? And, and, and I, I knew that India was undergoing at that very moment, the great reforms of that Manmohan Singh and Narsimha Rao and all had ushered in. And here I was, worrying about the market share of canteen shampoo in Venezuela. I said, something is wrong here with this life. Anyway, that was the trigger. Uh, my wife, of course, was a good sport. I quit and the, fortunately the kids were grown up. They were finishing, they'd finished college. And so some of our responsibilities were done and I came back to become a full-time writer. So, in, my, in, in a sense, so the next 25 years I've spent as a full-time writer, but it was only possible because I devoted my hobby or my weekend job, I took very seriously, as seriously as I took my weekday job. And it also shows basically that human beings have a lot of potential energy. We are, we've got many sides to us. 
and people slot us. Oh, he's a cigar chomping, fat bullet, bully, fat bellied businessman, or he's a starving writer. No, I think uh, it doesn't work like that. And I think what basically shows is that there are ways to make many ways to make a life, and that's how I made it my way. But now let me quickly move Harsh, uh, to the story of how a person and somebody I admire hugely made a life working, working inside the company. He came to us, to us, I say, I was then already the head of Procter & Gamble. He came as an evening shift security guard. So he'd come to work at six in the evening. He didn't know much. He was metric pass. He didn't know much English. And he, um, in fact, he was such a Dehati that he couldn't even pronounce the name of our company. His name was Kamble, and he called the company Procter and Gamble. And so here, but he had a childlike curiosity about everything. He wanted to know how the office worked. The first week he discovered the coffee and the tea machines. And he's, in his rounds, he was making tea and coffee and serving it to everybody. The next week, he discovered the telex machine. And even though he didn't know much English, he was sending telexes after a few weeks. Then he discovered the projector. Those days we, we were in advertising, we used to do a lot of advertising. So we needed projectors to look at advertising commercials and he knew how he ran the projector. And so here he was in a way, almost like a child who was having fun every moment of his life. There he was doing his security rounds and you, I mean, you can't imagine a more boring job, but he was having a ball. I think the best uh, moment for me was one day, I was up late till about 7, 7.30, and he uh, came by and he said, you know, I found this wallet outside the, the men's room. And he said that it belongs to so it's a very senior manager. And he also said he had opened it, the wallet, so he knew who it was. But it also contained a lot of cash. The manager had withdrawn, obviously, a lot of cash that day. So this guy was worried that that person had left the office, leaving his wallet behind. So he gave me the keys to the office. And he said, will you look after the security of this office? while I go and run and give this wallet to this man because he'd be dead worried. And so he got into a taxi and he ran and he went to Bandra and he gave the wallet. And I think nobody in his life would have been so happy to get because that even the reason there was a lot of cash in it is because that fellow was going to put a down payment for the dream house that his wife and he had selected and was a lot of money. And so this fellow uh, was grateful, but Kamble made sure that he never told that story to anyone because he didn't want people to know what he had done. And he, also told me, swore me to secrecy. That was just the kind of guy that he was. Anyway, about six months later, about nine months later, our receptionist went on maternity leave. That is the telephone operator. She used to be a receptionist come telephone operator. And she, uh, and Kamle went to the personnel head and he said, look, you know, uh, I've been, I'm tired of working at night. Why don't you give me a chance during the day 
and when she comes back from, let me be your temporary telephone operator during the daytime. When she comes back, she can have a job back. And the personnel guy said, Kamble, are you crazy? We are a multinational company. We get calls from around the world. And you even know, don't know how to pronounce the name of our company, Procter and Gamble. And, you know, so poor Gamble went with his, you know, looking pretty sad. But through the grapevine, I heard the story and I went to the personnel guy. I said, look, give him a chance. If, we, if he doesn't work out in a couple of days, we'll get somebody else. But boy, after a day after Gamble gets on the job, I meet our company lawyers, Crawford Bailey, Mr. Shah. And Mr. Ari Shah says to me, do you have a new EPPX system? I said, no. He says, well, you know, your phone is always answered on the second ring. Before, I would have to wait for the fourth, fifth, sixth ring before somebody picked it up. I said, no, no, our PPBX system is Mr. Kamle. And so that afternoon, I was going past the booth where Kamle sat. And I asked Kamle, I said, why do you answer the phone so quickly? And he said, there may be a customer at the other end. And I don't want someone else to get the order from the dealer. So, I mean, I think even the finance director of our company couldn't have given such a good answer. But that was Kamle. That was Kamle. He had, and you know, I, I'm just thinking about it because it was lucky. I mean, I left uh, India uh, to go to the world headquarters, etc. But uh, Kamle could not be stopped. He charged up everything, everybody around him. In, when he was working at night, people used to say, if anything you need, ask Kamble. Then after he became the telephone operator, anything you needed, you said, ask Kamble. And that was how he became, and I must tell you that the company it's a credit to the company because it recognized his value. And here's a metric pass who went on to become a director of the company. So there's a story. And what made him special is about the fact that he was actually not only making a living, but he was making a life at his job. He had that, I talked about this curiosity almost childish curiosity. You know, a child, when we all adults go past a puddle on, in, a, in, a, in the street when it's raining with our umbrellas and we go around the puddle, this fellow, like a child, would jump into the puddle. Well, that's what a child is. That's the whole, our gods, look at the Leela. The Leela the no notion, Krishna Leela, Ram Leela, Shiva, Shiva they, they were having fun. These gods, they were creating the universe and they were having a lot of fun. Well, I think he, that's the inspiration that he quietly went on to become a role model in every job. He was modest, self-effacing. Remember, he didn't want anybody to know about how he had found this wallet and so on. And, but I think the lesson I most important I learned from him is that attitude is more important than skills or even intelligence. And we all make the mistake when we hire people in our companies, we, recruit them and we ask them what knowledge they have, etc. Whereas we should be concerned about their attitude, how they do their jobs, and how they influence others. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a skill. 
in an in an interview to you know, find out such people. But really, I think that what Kamle's story really is a story of how you can make a life. And he would get so absorbed in his work that he'd forget himself. And he didn't care who got, whatever he did, he didn't care who got the credit, which is basically the notion of Nishkam Karma that Krishna talks about in the Gita, in chapter two, verse 47. And, and so I think that, you know, I used to, I was fascinated by that verse. And I used to believe that how can you not care who gets the credit? I mean, that's like uh, too idealistic. Um, it's, it's like asking people to shrink their egos and the ego won't shrink that far. It's like idealistic, like Marx's notion of equality, good aspiration, but not practical. But here was a guy who was actually practicing the notion of self-forgetting. Now, wouldn't we like to institutionalize Kamles in our, in our companies, create a culture of self-learning, self-development, integrity, and collaboration? Anyway, I want to leave you with these two stories here. Um, I, I, I personally think that uh, uh, that 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 there's a lot we can all learn uh, from from Kamble, and really, uh, ultimately, it boils down to living lightly, not carry the burden of the world. That notion in Sanskrit, which is with Patanjali made famous, called Lakhima, one of the Siddhis, of those who, of you who read Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, and create, make your work into a game. And, you know, maybe you too will be able to learn to self-forget. And, and when you're so absorbed that the time will get distorted. Kamble would always say that. He said, oh my God, it's six o'clock. And he thought, I thought he, he'd lost two hours suddenly. Anyway, so let me leave things there for you uh, with these two stories and uh, turn things back now to, I think, a Q&A with our audience. Uh, back to Harsh and Rekha. Thank you uh, for those two very uh, fascinating stories. Completely <clears throat> different, if I may say. Uh, and, and thank you very much for, for actually starting off and kicking off with, a very, with personal experiences and facets that, of your life and how you've woven that into how what you are today, uh, very interestingly. Thank you for sharing that uh, with us. So the Kamla story also has many management lessons, I suppose, in terms of as, as you have tried to clean out some of those. Uh, but we do have um, some, some people in the audience uh, who have questions and others, um, you know, who would put it in the chat box, etc. cetera. So uh, I, I'll kick off with a couple of questions that people have um, been asking. One is, of course, completely unrelated, but, but very interesting since you, uh, about your um, career as a writer. Uh, so here, Dr. Sanjay Bell wants to know, how did you choose your subjects and, uh, you know, characters for plays and novels and, and all of that? How do you go about doing that? Any, any thoughts about that? Well, um, I, I, it's, it's really the... the, the because I left India at a young age, first time at the age of 17. Before that, actually, I was also in high school for a while. But because I left India at a young age, I was, first thing was to figure out uh, the kind of education you have. And 
our schools, you don't really understand your country. So partly I write because I try to figure out the world. And if you are an Indian, my, I mean, India Unbound, for example, is a book on Artha, uh, how a poor country can become rich. And if you're an Indian, that's, you've got to be worried about. You want to be concerned about how, I mean, here we were a rich country that became poor and is going to be rich again. And how can that happen? So these, it's the subjects that get me going rather than the characters. And so the first was a play called Larinsa about the British in India and how they came to Punjab. So the man, Lawrence means Lawrence, Henry Lawrence, who was the first, uh, uh, the first resident in Punjab of the, at that time, East India Company, soon to become the Brit Britain and the British Empire. And uh, so it was, a, I was interested to know how the British and the Indian kind of reacted and got learned from each other. And so it's an exciting story in Punjab, set in Punjab after Ranjit Singh is dead between widow Rani Jinda and the Sikh Sardars and so on. And this unusual English pun in Henry Lawrence. Right, thank you, thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, uh, another question is that, you know, the Kamala story has actually inspired a lot of comments. So there are comments ranging from, you know, people saying that could it have happened in other companies other than uh, an MNC like, uh, like PNG, uh, or how can a company <coughs> build a culture that can get such people uh, to, to come to the fore and how do we go about doing that? So, so there are many questions I'm trying to combine them around this around this uh, story, you know, how, how common are these stories, etc. Et Thanks. Well, you know, uh, uh, a company has to learn, I mean, you know, in, in the, 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 the thing about working in a company is that Either you, if performance matters, you want everybody to deliver. And this guy was over delivering from day number one. He was serving tea and coffee while doing his rounds of security. And so I would, have, I would think that most heads of companies are rational people. They may have prejudices, yes. I mean, the guy was a Dehati from Akola, but he was, you know, in the evening, people would say, if you want needed anything, ask Kamle. He didn't have to know English to ask. <laughs> he would give you a good answer in Marathi. <laughs> and so, I think so. I think it can happen. You have to create a culture, first of all, of openness openness of accepting people and then valuing them for what they bring to the table, which is, I mean, to me, a very um, rational idea. You want your company to do well. You want people, high performers in companies. So the guy was a high performer, started as a assistant security guard, but then whatever job we gave him, shook. he was good at it everything and right to the top he went and and so it does look like a fairy i mean it sounds like a fairy story right but the it's a tribute both to him i suppose and the company that they were able to see somebody who was outstanding so it's a good lesson, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, there is one, one other question, which is, you know, 
how is it possible to share? Uh, I mean, how do we, how do, let me put it this way, how do we identify our own natural interests uh, that helps us make our life? So we have natural interests. As we, as we discussed, we are all in the rat race. But how do we go about identifying that which can help us make a life versus making a living? A very good question. I think this is the this is the role that our parents, our teachers should play. My mother, when I said she made a mistake, when she asked me, did you stand first? My father told her that, look, you should be more interested, not in his standing first, but what does he really enjoy? Does he enjoy school? And in school, what does he like doing? And all through life, I mean, look, we're not, all like Mozart, who mm. at the age of three was a mu knew that he was a musical genius. And by the age of five, he had written his first symphony. Now he was lucky he had a father who recognized his talent and so on. But we are not geniuses. Most of us just stumble through life. And it is a question of sort of in the process of stumbling, you discover. Like when I start, went from an ivy covered halls at Harvard to the dusty bazaars of uh, Ghaziabad or uh, Gurgaon and all sorts of places, uh, I was also stumbling. And it was so happened that when you travel, as you know, you stay in some Sri Krishna lodge in some town like Ratlam in the evening, and you have nothing to do because even the film that's running in the town, you've seen it already. So that's where you have time. And I think human beings, as I said, have huge amount of energy. I mean, even on a daily basis, you know, you spend eight hours at work, or 10 hours at work, but you have 24 hours. There's a lot you can do in 24 hours. And well, we need to sleep seven, eight hours, yes. But you subtract that, you need to eat for a little while, but there's a hell of a lot of time. And the secret is to keep a sense of keep yourself open. And I kind of stumbled into writing. I never took a writing course in college. But I just thought this would be a way to keep engaged. I kept reading and then I said, oh my God, I can't keep reading only. You've got to give back a little bit, something you've read. You write about it. So that's how it kind of started for me. And I think you're made a very good, the question is a very important question. How do you discover your passion? And it is the job of our parents your us, your grandchildren, that's your role to make them um, make them uh, uh, discover what they like. That I think is very, very important. And my father, as I mentioned, sorry, very quickly, that my father was unlike my mother, was quite happy, he was relaxed. He didn't have our middle class insecurity. He was relaxed. He was, he was very happy when I studied, started studying philosophy. I was interested in architecture. You know, in liberal education, you can study anything you want. And until my junior year, first two years, I was doing Greek tragedy. I was doing Sanskrit. I studied Sanskrit at Harvard. Can you believe that? In fact, I mean, I very seriously studied Sanskrit at, at, at Harvard. That's why I was able to write a book like The Difficulty of Being Good, because I knew Sanskrit. Anyway, that's, that's the, the, the point, is to make it you, through education yourself and through, the, the, you need to have a bit of a quest, a, a questioning mind. All right, I've talked too much on this. No, but I, 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 this provokes uh, a, I would say a, just a common, not a question really, is that, you know, and I was also reflecting on what you were saying just now. You know, 
there isn't that much, unfortunately, in our current education system that allows this questioning, critical questioning or reflection of the mind. You talked about something important. And I, I'll tell you why I relate to that. You talked about the fact that at Harvard, you, you had a liberal arts education. I'm sure you, you had with your father, as you said, being the questioning person and allowing you to discover parts of, you know, your, your facets of your life added to that. But it is, it is this kind of an education uh, uh, which is more holistic, which allows us to, to go beyond, you know, just the, the skills, whether it's arithmetic or this or that or the professional degrees. And now as we move into education today, this, uh, what do we call it? Uh, the, 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 um, I, the word escapes me. New education policy. Yes, no, not, yeah. not the new education policy, but what I mean is that you, you uh, have interdisciplinary education. Yeah. Even if you're doing engineering, there are mandatory courses that you would do on, on writing, on critical thinking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this part of, of our education is getting neglected, which is leading to more, you know, as you say, stereotyped workers or people. Yeah. But I, I didn't want to question you on that, but, but that really is. And I, yeah. and I think- Let me just interrupt you for a second, Harsh. Yeah. Fortunately, this kind of liberal education, the, the government also now in the new education policy has recognized this. And there will be a lot more flexibility in the future. We already have very good examples in India, like Ashoka. Ashoka yeah. University is a classical liberal arts, liberal education university. And frankly, um, when I was telling you, I was doing economics, I was doing philosophy, politics, literature. I was doing the Russian novel. I took a course on Greek tragedy, took a course on art, modern architecture. Now, these are the things I think that made, me, made it possible for me to live the kind of life I have. And, and that I think is a very good point. Great, thank you. Uh, one, other, one other quick um, point, if I may, um, on, uh, on this um, entire thing. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, we have uh, our office bearers here as well. Um, our Vice President Srini, are you here still? Srinivas Dempo, if you're here, I, would you like to um, have an observation or a question? I saw you there earlier. If you were there, can you unmute yourself? Is he, Rekha, is he there? Uh, I saw, I saw. Srini. He's there, he's there. Okay, if he, if he wants to. I don't know if he's muted or what, uh, where is he? Can we unmute Mr. Dempo? Meanwhile, uh, do you want to ask another question? Harsh? Yeah, I, I, I think um, we're not being able to get him there. Um, anyway, uh, other questions around? The, one, one other comment I'd, I'd want to say. A lot of what you've said is that Actually, the lockdown has provided a very interesting um, situation, whether you call it lockdown one or even now. It has caused, I, I know from personal experience, we talk to people, it has forced us in a sense, a lot of us to reevaluate uh, parts of our lives. Because a lot of us have discovered that we can do well with less, for example. And, and a whole lot of other things that we were running around in our, in our lives, you know, attending this social or doing that and, and a whole lot of stuff which was not so necessary. So that was, you know, making the living part of it. And I think it's forced a little bit of a reflection on what is it that we want to do to make a life. Would you have any, any comments or reflections around that? Well, I mean, you're right. Uh, clearly... Um, um, it's, it has made people reflect uh, about, their, about their own lives. And uh, a lot of people have never been alone so much. And one of the things that comes from solitude is reflection. 
Um, but you know, there are a lot of people who are hyping the pandemic also. Uh, and I think, frankly, we had a bigger pandemic in 2018, sorry, 1918, 100 years ago, called the Spanish flu. Many more people died, 20 million Indians died. 50 million people died around the world. But three, two, three years later, people had forgotten it. They were on to, it led to a very big era of prosperity in the world. Uh, and it led to many, many uh, technological advances after that. And if people, yes, people remembered the First World War, but they almost forgot the pandemic. Of course, now we live in a much more connected world. So we, everything affects us. We know what's going on everywhere. But I'm not one of those who hypes this pandemic. I mean, the sooner it, the wretched thing goes away and we can resume our lives, I think we'll resume it. There'll be... There are technological trends that are already available, which are going to make a very big difference, like artificial intelligence, the whole digital economy was already on its way before the pandemic came. It's just accelerated, it, that's all. Right. There are, there are several other questions which come up, but I, I'm also mindful of the time. We are at seven o'clock. We are at 58. You've got two more minutes. Yeah, I know we have two minutes, but we also have to um, sort of thank you for, for a bit. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pop up one interesting question which came up, which is, um, which is there. I, I see the Srini finally is there. You have... Do um, um, you want to come in? I, I can see you there. Yes, yes, Harshan. Yeah, please go ahead, Srinivas Dempo. Uh, thank you, uh, Thank you, Mr. Das, for this very enlightening talk. Uh, the question that I had for you, sir, is, uh, you know, we, many of us run our family businesses. And we are now at an age where our children are growing up. And uh, there is some sort of pressure that they feel that one is being entitled to the family business and secondly is taking on the responsibility. Uh, if I hear your uh, talk a few uh, half an hour back, one hour back, the feeling that I get is that we should leave them to their passions, leave them to their thinking, and then let them decide. I just wanted your thoughts on the same, because increasingly now, the younger generation wants to do things on their own, and they do not may not want to join the family business. I just wanted your thoughts on the same. Yeah, I totally agree with them. I mean, if they, they should do their passion. There's only one life to lead, remember. Of course, if you believe in 84 lives, then you probably think a little differently. But at least uh, this, but there's this one life that we all have to lead. And let's lead it with a degree of pleasure, passion, making a life, make this life into something. And, you know, I'm, since I was a professional manager, I'm got a very strong bias that Indian businesses would be very much better off if they brought in professionals early, done the running of the businesses to the professionals. And in any case, I mean, that, that the, you know, there's a saying in India, Haveli ki umar saat sal. That is the life of a business house is 60 years. So you have 60 years, my friend, running family businesses, before yeah, that house goes oh, under to make it into an institution and really leave it in the hands of professionals. And you should play a role, the governance role, be on the board, etc. But not run businesses and give your kids a chance to really do. I mean, some of them may want to be in business, you know, but uh, many of them won't. And, and so, uh, so that would be my, my own feeling uh, to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one last, yeah, I know we are over time, but uh, I just saw. Raju Kanoria, you have a question or any, anything we can get you to? If you, are you able to unmute yourself or no? No? And the... Uh, yes. No, no, I don't have anything at all. Okay. I mean, I have always, it's always a pleasure to listen to Gurcharan. I mean, we've had him over speaking at home, IPO, so many ends. I mean, I, and yet I, you know, I've heard some of these stories, particularly about this young, enthusiastic man in Procter and Gamble. So I think, uh, I think it's a very appropriate uh, and, uh, you know, especially in these times when all of us are trying to find where we really are in our life and what we really wish to do and whether we have done it or whether we'd still like to do something different from what we've done. Okay, thanks a lot for your comments. And uh, on that on that happy note, uh, I, I think we'll end the session here. Gurjanti, once again, um, many, many thanks for doing this for us and for sharing your, your thoughts in a very plain uh, yet thought-provoking uh, manner. Uh, leaving certainly a lot of things for all the audience to reflect on and, uh, and review on. So uh, thank you very much for, for doing that. We wish you um, good luck and um, good health, as well as we look forward to your next novel, as you were saying at the beginning of, the, of this uh, meeting. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and the interesting thing is you've written on a, on a variety of subjects and, and the most interesting part of all of this, I think, is the fact that you blend our Indian philosophy and mythology and thoughts into a lot of this. So they are not just nice to read novels, but they are, they are really uh, writings that provoke a great thought. But thank you once, once again for being here. Rekha, any, any closing comments? I think we had a lot of people. We had, we had uh, Rekha, I think you can give us an update on that one, but I think we had a lot of people. The whole thing was-, um, was Yeah, cold. I think we, we had a limit, unfortunately, of 500 on this, so which we kept uh, breaching so we directed a lot of people to the social media platform so we had over 1200 people overall joining the session uh, to us. and I'm sure uh, we'll get many more uh, views as we put it on our IMA TV which is available on the IMA website and thank you for an absolutely wonderful session always great to have you with us and so much learning and thanks to you IMA has also got thanked and got some wonderful comments and of course, the comments for you are absolutely outstanding. I'm glad everybody enjoyed the session. So thank you very much. And I'd like to invite uh, everyone to join us for the next Leader Speak session on the 10th of June from 12.30 to 1.30. So that's not in the evening. It's from 12.30 to 1.30 with Dr. Rakesh Mohan. We'll talk about the Indian economy. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Das, once again. Thank you, Mr. Sipania. Thank you all, and apologies to all the people who wanted to ask uh, further questions, but we ran out of time simply. Thanks, Guru Chandri. Take care. Bye.